I got something special for you today. It's gonna be a Gigabyte server review. We're actually gonna build the server. If you've ever been sort of curious about, hey, could I get a bare bones server and sort of DIY it? This video is really a server review, but I'm gonna show you how you can build a server. You'd be surprised how much overhead major OEMs charge you to just, you know, take a server like this that they've got a warehouse full of, and they've got, you know, rooms and rooms full of processors and memory. And when you order a machine, they just go and grab the memory and the processor, shove it in, charge you thousands of dollars and send it out the door. Now you also get other things that you pay for, you pay a lot for, like on-site service and, you know, immediate tech support and that kind of thing. But the software is getting to the point where the servers really just don't matter. You could build a cluster of three identical servers like this and have better than a four hour SLA because literally any one physical server could completely die and the other two machines in the server will take over. VMware clusters. We, we, we did some videos on doing like poor man's VMware, VMware clusters where you have two physical machines and like a Raspberry Pi, which is not recommended or supported, but it does work to use as a witness appliance. This, this video, it's gonna be a quickie build. So when you order a bare bones server, what can you expect in the box? Well, first, you've got basically everything you need to get started, except the operating system, memory, and processors. So this is a rack mount server. It comes with rack rails. Yeah, this is not a $200 extra or a $500 extra or anything like that. They're right in the box. You get the rails. You also get the CPU cooling solution, which is usually specific to the particular chassis that you're using. In our case, these are 1U heat sinks. And then you get some retention clips for your processors, and we'll get to those in a minute. You've also got a bag of mounting screws for your storage solution. It's labeled HDD screw in our case. All that packing for this glorified pizza box. And that's pretty much it. One rack unit of server gives you a lot of server. It's almost entirely RAM slots all the way across. We've got dual processor slots and then of course plastic ducting to ensure proper airflow for our solution. We're gonna put those 28 core CPUs in here. It's gonna run hot. We've also got three expansion slots, three expansion slots that are half height. You've got some options in terms of uh, what your configuration chassis is, so you can get some different options here. We've also got two OCP slots, so if you wanna run dual 10 gig, 25 gig, 100 gig on those OCP connections and keep your PCIe slots free, you can totally do that. We've also got 10 two and a half inch SATA connections at the front, although this chassis is available with NVMe as an option as well. As configured here, we've got two 1200 watt power supplies. You know, one of the things that I don't like about OEMs is when you, you know, order the low end or the mid range CPUs with your pre-configuration, they'll actually swap out the higher end power supplies with lower end power supplies. So if you get a one U server like this and halfway through its service lifetime, say two and a half years later, you go to upgrade the processors because we're right now the 28 core processors, they're kind of expensive, but you know, a year or two or three down the road, those 28 core processors are probably gonna cost less than half of what they do now, maybe even less than a third. So wouldn't it be nice if you could just swap those in? Well, you can with the 1200 watt power supply. If you've got a power supply that's been sized to be just enough power for exactly the way that the system was configured when it shipped, you're not gonna be putting those 28 core processors in a chassis like this. That's definitely not something the Gigabyte does, but other OEMs will tend to do that. So pay attention to your power supplies when you're ordering servers. All right, let's get started and set up our CPUs. Here's our RAM. We've got a lot of RAM. We got RAM bunches with the RAM. Here's our matched pair, our Xeon Gold 6254. Now this might look familiar. This is a socket 3647. This is the same socket that the ultra, ultra, ultra high end W3175X uses. But these processors cost even more than the W3175. 3.1 gigahertz out of the box, extreme turbo. But what kind of performance can we expect from a 1U chassis? Let's find out. They do come with pre-installed thermal paste. So the retention clip mechanism is kind of odd. You get the heat sink and then you get the clip and then you put the processor in and then the whole thing goes in hopefully. And then you've also got this little protection thing to protect the socket. You gotta, gotta keep this. Mm -hmm. 
And of course, tighten the holes down in the right order. Very important, the screw torque is 14 plus or minus 0.5 kilogram per centimeter. Very important. In case you ever need to ship your system back for RMA, and you're gonna keep your processors, save your processor cover and the little protector sheet in here so you don't get thermal paste everywhere. Now our CPUs are installed. The only other thing if you're DIYing your server is making sure that you get good memory. Gigabyte publishes a QVL, stands for a Qualified Vendor List, and it's a list of memory that they've tested and qualified with their particular system. So for this build, I'm using Micron 32 gig. This is two ranks by four PC 3200. Each stick is 32 gigabytes. This is registered ECC memory. Really there's about three types of DDR4. You've got registered and unregistered error correction, and then just regular old PC desktop memory. For servers, you always wanna use registered error correcting memory. Registered error correcting has a special register. It's a set, literally a set of registers on another non-memory IC on the DIMM, and that helps the server basically use gobs and gobs of memory because you know desktop machines are usually limited to like 256 gigs, maybe 512 gigs or a terabyte. Servers, you know, two terabytes is not unusual. One really handy thing that Gigabyte does is puts this sticker on the inside of the chassis so that you can see where the memory should go for an optimal configuration. There's two other subtypes of registered memory, LRDIM and LRDIM 3DS, and you can also have RDIM 3DS, I suppose. These are different memory configurations aimed at super extreme densities because when you start getting 32 and 64 and 128 gigabyte DIMMs or even Optane DIMMs, memory uh, power usage sort of becomes a concern because not every motherboard is designed with extreme power usage in mind and also you gotta make sure that you got adequate cooling. So always consult the manual and the qualified vendor list to make sure that the registered memory kit that you're ordering for your server is definitely going to be compatible. Other than that, if you've ever installed memory in a desktop computer, it's really not a lot different. Just go slow, make sure you're in a static safe environment or using a static mat and uh, you know, try not to put it in backwards or upside down. Now you might be wondering how much memory is optimal? Well, these Intel CPUs have six memory channels. So if you want maximum memory performance, you would use six sticks of memory per CPU. But there are actually 12 slots per CPU in this chassis, and there's two different colors, blue and black. What that means is that you can actually have two physical sticks of memory on a given channel. Now you can have less than that. You can have as little as one stick of memory per CPU, and sometimes inexpensive bare bones configurations that include CPUs and memory will ship with a configuration like this. Like you'll get a server and it says, oh, it's got 64 gigs of memory. But the reality is that it actually has one stick of memory per CPU. That is definitely a suboptimal configuration. In general, uh, Intel server CPUs are not really sensitive to memory speed. Like, you're not gonna get artificially low performance if you only use, say, four sticks of memory per CPU. You can even get away with two sticks of memory per CPU, but I don't really recommend it because of the internal silicon topology on the uh, 3647 CPUs. Basically, it's a big piece of silicon, and there's memory controllers on each side of the CPU. So if you can get a little bit of memory on both sides of the CPU, you're gonna be in better shape from a performance standpoint. So you can get away with running four sticks of memory per CPU and not have too much of a performance loss unless your particular server workload is super memory bandwidth dependent, in which case it's worth getting six sticks of memory per CPU. Now for my particular memory kit, I've got 24 sticks of memory, so I'm gonna be able to fill this thing completely up with 32 gig sticks of memory. And that's it. Now all we have to do is add storage to this server and we're good to go. That does have 10 SATA bays in the front. And again, it has NVMe as an option. So if you'd rather have NVMe, you can get a higher tier chassis with that. For my storage, I'm gonna be using the Liquid HHHL, which is a really, really high performance PCI Express form factor NVMe SSD. These are available in capacities up to like 24 terabytes, 32 terabytes. There's room in this system to put three of these, which is a little bananas but uh, I've just got the one and it's a lower capacity, but it's already got Linux pre-installed and so we can do our Linux benchmarking with it. So now I've got my high-speed NVMe storage. I can also use the front for bulk storage with SATA drives or, or whatever, because you can get those up to eight terabytes each and you know, eight times 10 is 80 and that's 80 terabytes in a one U chassis. That's pretty good. 
Now the configuration on one of these is not just installing the memory and processors, although that's, that's the easiest part. And also if you're gonna get this from a system integrator or VAR in your area, maybe there's a gigabyte reseller in your area, and they wanna charge you more than like two or three hours to do what I just did, well you can see I did it in like 15 minutes and I really did not rush at all. I went kind of slow actually. So, you know, depending on what sort of testing your integrator's doing, it really shouldn't be more than whatever the equivalent hourly charge is for two or three hours of work. Maybe four hours if they're also gonna help you set up an operating system or do some really, really basic testing, but overall it's pretty easy to do. Now once you've got it set up, the next thing that you can do is actually remote into the machine even when it's off. That A-speed microchip on the board is an IPMI controller and you get that for free. You get remote keyboard, remote mouse, remote video. There's no extra license fee or anything like that with the Gigabyte platform. It's all built in, there's no extra upcharge. You definitely see that on servers from HP and Dell. It's like you want all the bells and whistles with the remote management, you're gonna pay extra. You can actually download software from Gigabyte if you've got a fleet of these or a cluster of these like I was mentioning before, you can manage all of the machines from one central console. Gigabyte gives you the software for that. This model is basically the base model, but, so it's only got two built-in one gig NICs, but it still has a dedicated IPMI management port. So you can have a physically separate management network because well, it is a little dangerous from a security standpoint to have full remote access to your machine, just like a keyboard and mouse, but over a network. So you definitely want that on a secured separate network. And this machine gives you that no extra charge. Again, sometimes you have to pay extra for the, ne the physical network interface that's for your management network. Nope, it's built right in the system. Now booting the system, it is a one use system. It is designed for the data center. It's gonna be loud. It's designed for airflow. It's gonna move airflow from the front to the back. It's designed to be in a whole stack of these generating hundreds of watts of heat. I mean, 1200 watts. That's basically as many watts as a hairdryer. So this thing producing as much heat as a hairdryer in a worst case scenario, it's gonna to need to make a little noise. When this displays an IP address for your local network, it'll try to pull it via DHCP. You can go there in a web browser and continue configuring your server. So obviously don't plug it in the internet if it's gonna get a public IP, otherwise somebody in Russia is gonna configure your server. It's probably gonna be bad. Once the internal system figures itself out, you're gonna get your good old standard issue BIOS screen and you can hear that the fans did ramp down just a bit. So let's dive into those benchmarks. So remember, our system is configured with a Xeon Gold 6254 CPU. That's 18 cores, 36 threads. It's two sockets, which is really pretty impressive for this 1U configuration. I mean, these are 200 watt TDP processors. They come in at a 3.1 gigahertz base frequency and a 4.0 gigahertz maximum turbo frequency. They're fast. They're zippy little processors, you know, 18 cores per socket. It's pretty good. Intel does offer some other versions of the Gold processor. They actually have another Xeon Gold that's in the 6250, you know, family that is only eight cores, but has a much higher turbo frequency and even a higher TDP. So depending on what your software licensing is and what your performance requirements are, there's really something here for everybody. But with six memory channels and, you know, the expandability here that we see in this chassis, it is a pretty zippy system. Of course, Intel is facing stiff competition from AMD, and so you can sort of see that come out in some of the Pharonix benchmarks. Of course, depending on what it is that we run, you see the, the Intel optimization advantage in some tests, but then in other tests, you see that, you know, maybe the AMD part sort of comes ahead. I mean, the recommended customer price of these processors is, you know, $3,803, but depending on your reseller and other configurations and things like that, you can find these in a package deal for quite a bit less. So your total system cost really may be uh, some of the driver there in terms of looking at your system, but you can use these benchmarks as a reference and see how this system is gonna perform, depending of course on, on what you're looking at. There's not really any, any surprises here. I mean, the max turbo frequency being about four gigahertz means that lightly threaded and you know uh, applications that depend on single thread performance are gonna perform exceptionally well. Things like PHP applications, <laughs> if you wanna, PHP application that is like a horrible dog and insanely slow because it's a million lines of PHP code, not talking about like, you know, a million users on the server, but you know, a small number of users with an insanely complicated PHP program, well, that single thread speed is gonna pull far ahead of what AMD offers. Of course, AMD now just released this, the, uh, you know, 7F processors, which are frequency optimized. So things are happening in the server space that are really exciting in terms of 
performance and tit for tat and pricing and all of the stuff that goes with that. So uh, don't be afraid to consult with your value added reseller or your consultant or whatever. You may be able to get a really good deal on systems like these from either Team Red or Team Blue, depending on what it is that you're looking for. But these benchmarks will give you some idea of how the system is going to perform overall, especially when you're using like Linuxy server type workloads. And of course, if you're using Windows Server 19, well, that's a video for another day. The Pharonix test suite can be a really torturous experiment. I mean, it's really hard on servers. The fans will ramp, it will get a bit loud, but this system had no problem handling the full load. The CPUs performed exactly like you would expect. There was no bottleneck or thermal throttling or anything, any other considerations. In the UEFI, I did configure the system for performance, which will dump a little bit more wattage into the CPU. It'll configure the power preferences for the CPU to get maximum performance. There's probably a little bit of gigabyte special sauce in there, but it was rock solid. Even 48 hours of burn-in testing with everything that I could throw at it, everything that I could throw at it in terms of even NVMe access, it handled it all like a champ. This is a really solid server platform. And as I showed you, it's really easy to DIY this and you can save thousands of dollars DIYing this. If you're worried about SLA or uptime or whatever, you know, this system is a no frills system. It's got a lot of features, a lot of value, but you can get two or three of them and build your own redundant system that's redundant in software. Pretty much gone are the days of over-engineered servers that have lots of redundancy that you're probably not going to need. Yes, we've got redundant power supplies. Yes, we've got error correcting memory. Yes, our storage solution is redundant. But if you have a major outage or a major failure or CPU pops or you need to take it down for firmware upgrades because we've had a lot of that lately, then this is going to be a great solution in a clustered configuration because you can run multiple servers. And even if one whole server dies, it doesn't really matter. Overall, Gigabyte has done an excellent job with this platform and putting it together and making sure that you've got everything that you need and nothing that you don't. It's a solid performer. There's not really any compromises in terms of performance. So overall, good job, Gigabyte. I'm Wendell, this is level one. This has been a quick look at a 1U Intel dual processor server with all of the RAM slots. It's fast.